Um, this is going to be an intuitive um, uh, presentation to you today, but I do want to link the, um, the words of the proem in The Secret Doctrine um, to the very important um, below that we're going to take a look at from the as above using the um, accepted hematic axiom as above so below. Because if we read the part of the proem in The Secret Doctrine, it says that the pilgrim is the name given to our monad. I should be referring to this uh, up here, our monad there on the, on the top left, during its cycle of incarnations. It is the only immortal and eternal principle in us, bringing an indivisible part of the integral whole, the universal spirit from which it emanates and into which it is absorbed at the end of the cycle. So all these fine words that come out, it's our job to put an idea behind this. And obviously what is being referred to here is the greater cycles. These are the cycles of manifestation and non-manifestation, known in the Sanskrit as manvantara for a period of manifestation and pralaya as a period of rest. And of course we see this in our own cycle of incarnations in the expressive life that we have uh, on the physical world and then we go into a relative although the soul is active on its own plane and which we'll be discussing today as part of this journey the soul is active on its own plane we sleep in the um uh, uh, the period that we call uh, life between uh, life or the death so-called death period and so we have to take these grand words and ideas and bring them down if we're going to truly take knowledge try and apply it to our lives and turn the theosophical wisdom into a living wisdom. I think it was Kutumi, one of the great authors of the Mahatma Letters, who said, it's no good storing knowledge on the mental plane, that's not going to help you in the next life, but if you've taken knowledge and you've been able to use it towards your own self-improvement and none of the major initiations that we talk about in Theosophy, none of them at all can come to any of us until we start to seriously look inwards at ourselves. And this is part of this journey. Just to finish off, the eternity of the pilgrim is like a wink in the eye of self-existence according to the Book of the Sun. The appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a regular tidal ebb of flux and reflux. Well, we don't really see our lives like that, do we? Because if we're all honest with ourselves, we see this life as being of paramount importance. How many people really truly say that they see this life as a preparation for the next life? Because it was touched on by Janet Holt's talk this morning. She mentions about horoscopes, how we are constantly today making and remaking our future. We can do it by understanding our karma, which I need to talk about today as part of this journey, and we need to understand it for our spiritual growth. How are we doing as a personality made up of three very obvious planes of existence, a physical body, a set of feelings, and a mental body that thinks in words. Be very careful with words, we all read a lot of them. But there, when you pass on from this plane, there is no message in the astral world, in English, French, Swahili, New Zealand, telling you you're dead. Words are a function of the brain and we use language to communicate, but behind all I uh, words are ideas. And what we need to do is understand the ideas. When I get impressed from the inner worlds, they don't give me words, they give me images and symbols one after the other sometimes and I have to put those into words. And so today we're going to take a journey the journey of the eternal pilgrim to have a look and see if we can unpick some of the energies involved in this process and further than that relate them to some of the key issues that I've had the opportunity to address having done hundreds and hundreds of esoteric horoscopes in the last eight, nine, ten years. 
What do I mean when I say esoteric horoscopes? We have this monad. I'm not going to dwell on it. We had the absolute this morning given to us by Janet in her talk, and she gave the great qualities of the I am, if you like. It's pure existence. It's where we were when we were in the Garden of Eden, and there was only subjective knowledge. That's all there was. We were blissfully unaware of the objective the objective world being knowledge of ourselves or of something else and by eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge man fell into matter and i'm afraid i can't get any more words on there but i hope you can read spirit and i hope you can read matter there and i hope you can read consciousness in between because we are conscious of what we wish to identify with and if you want to co consciously identify with your physical body and that alone you can likewise with your astral or with your lower mind but of course we can study theosophy and we can say ha ah, but i'm getting fairly good at abstract thought i can read sections of the secret i can get something out of it i can understand arguments on consciousness absolute and relative that david was no doubt talking about in his workshops but we have to always remember that there has been a huge sacrifice on this journey we're going to talk about sacrifice in the middle of this picture but it starts here the monad sacrifices a huge amount of energy and consciousness as it puts a thread down to form a soul and as that soul further getting heavier and heavier in its vibrations a personality and that personality is in the, the, the three worlds not always able to pick up on what the script is. And for many, many years we stumble about in the dark, lurching from one life to another because we're being tossed about on a sea of karma. And we're being tossed about on the sea of karma. Karma exists in these three worlds. There is physical karma for the individual. This is, I can't go into national karma, but we can see that sometimes um, with some of the tragedies that befall just a single country. Um, emotional karma, which I can tell you bedevils an awful lot of people that I see. And um, lower mind, lower mental karma, where that can be uh, the way that we treat people, uh, the, the, the words that come out, they may not be emotional, we can cut people down, we can be cruel, we can be separative in our actions. And this will create karma, which we have to address. And it's when the karmic lessons become so difficult for people that they realize that something has to be done. And through esoteric astrology, we can look at karma. But the first indication of this path is that we need to be cooperative with the spiritual way. And the spiritual way is that we come down from a very high point, which we can philosophize and we can talk, we're going to just call it the monad at the moment. And we have to learn reaction capacities, capacities to react in every which way in the physical world, the emotional world and the mental world. And we do this for something like, it is said symbolically, 700 lives, but an awful lot of lives. And what happens in that 700 odd lives is that you build up habits physical, emotional and mental. And that's what makes you today the person you are. And if you don't think it's important that you look into your life as it is lived by yourself, physically, emotionally and mentally, then you're missing a huge trick because we can pontificate, and I do quite a lot, all we like on the mental plane, but if we are not able to what we call integrate these bodies, the soul cannot use us in true service. And that is the point of being down here in the age of Aquarius. And we mustn't forget as theosophists that the age of Aquarius is upon us and it has as its motto as it were man woman know thyself if you don't know yourself you can't change yourself now i was at gary's excellent work um, study group this morning 
um, which deals with archetypes and the unconscious and I want to remind you that in your personal horoscope your unconscious is mapped out for you there and by definition if you can understand your unconscious you expand consciousness and by expanding consciousness you become aware of not only your karma through the planets Saturn and Mars you become aware of your opportunities for spiritual growth you become aware of some of these habitual natures that have been built up over all of these lifetimes that you've had and that suddenly you're very annoyed or irritated or upset as because you're in a situation and suddenly you react in a way like that and that's because it's now if you don't look behind those responses you're not going to reach the point of the second initiation which is to do with the taming of the astral body because make no mistake the astral body and the mental body are their own living entities and unless soul energy as part of the journey can be poured in through this rainbow bridge then we are going to have um, these running away with things and you know for the first 700 lives the soul will sleep and allow that to happen and there's plenty of people in Chester and the environs at the moment happily shopping coming back from work whatever stuck in traffic jams at rush hour whatever it might be who are living a life which is part of the involutionary arc part of the process of falling into matter and we've all done it and we've all been there until we re reach the nadir and the life starts to become infused with a duality that we may first just hear as the first intimations of a conscience but there's something else there and theosophy provides lots of disciplines for bringing that out when the time is right for you and you all have your own place on this path of evolution and we're all at a different point of this path of evolution and you will get an idea of that and I talk shortly about the opening of the petals of the causal body which surrounds the soul and which is ultimately destroyed at the third initiation to allow the soul to be released but let's talk about what the problems facing all of us are and that is that we have a soul made up of higher energies but the soul has its own path of evolution as well but it is dependent on the cooperation of the personality who can be down here to act with what I call relative free will in the areas I've discussed and if we are good with our emotions and we are generous with our money we will attract good karma into our lives and maybe be allowed to leave our jobs at 50 and have a life that's not too difficult afterwards that's often how that karma can work out but we also only when the soul comes knocking we've got the opportunity to start to place seeds in the cosmic bank and this is where we bring in the qualities of the soul that we can start to think in a method that is nothing to do with words remember a picture paints a thousand words and we become attracted by symbol we have an excellent guy called Clemens Brennan coming along to do the psychic tarot he gave me a tarot reading that you know a few years ago that was absolutely tremendous but it, rem it reminded me of the importance of all types of symbology the Jungian psychology, man and his symbols, wonderful big book. Uh, all the types of uh, work that we do with any symbols like astrology, uh, mythology, uses lots of images, etc. The truth can be given to us in images and we will react with the right side of our brain. And one of the things is if you decide that you want to put the foot on the accelerator of your spiritual life in this life, then you have to make the space for it and that's the subjective space now that is allowing the right side of the brain to have a say because I'm afraid that the left side of the brain and I know only too well with degrees at university professional qualifications and a career in high finance which I had to give up all of all of that and the money that went with it because the right side the soul was pounding away at it because I was told I was an old soul who wasn't learning 
and there may be amongst yourselves also and you know of the root of these problems is lying in the state of the vehicles now i'm not going to talk too much about the physical vehicle because it's so self-apparent but you do need to look at ideas of uh, uh, what you eat nutrition is very important what you nourish yourself with what you choose to eat or what not to eat but the biggest single factor that I have been told from the inner world that is absolutely desperately required is some form of emotional integration and I'm going to mention it now as part of our journey. Part of what was said in the program why we have joys and we have sufferings. We've indicated karma and I'm assuming that most people know what we mean by karma. It is the law of cause and effect. The great difficulty with karma when I see somebody's karmically laden in their chart is that things happen in this life, we'll call that the effect, but the cause is in a previous life. And people say, it's not fair. Why has this happened to me? I'm a decent person. I know someone who isn't and they don't have these problems. Now we all know that, that and that's because the karma's hidden. You know, but what we have to do is whatever the problems we have is remain harmless and have the courage to go through what is what what, what we need to go through because it becomes easier the more you build this bridge. You cannot evolve in that triangle. There is a plan of evolution out there that we are part of, whether we accept it or not. And we are down here to live as part of that plan. And I'm not preaching at you because I know it's true and it's been made, it's been shown to me in many, many different ways. I remember seeing Douglas Baker, who's my mentor in esoteric astrology um, in the late 1990s. And he said to me, he said, you're going to be a lecturer. You'll go around the world. You'll do." I said, that'd be ridiculous. I said, I'm an accountant in the NHS. But how things changed, he was able to see the pattern of the destiny. And you all have your patterns of destiny, but you will not pick it up through concentrating on the left side of your brain and maybe giving yourself mental indigestion by reading too much wisdom and keeping it on an intellectual level without it being on an intuitive level. And it only becomes on an intuitive level when you allow yourself to first of all take the brain waves which go through like this may be at theta level to the alpha waves which start to flatten out and this comes not when you're thinking and rationalizing but when you're brooding and pondering on things reflecting and then you might find that you're able to stop your thoughts and something will be dropped into the space between thoughts and a symbol an image a direction a signpost and it will electrify you because you know you're being told something and so we need to understand the receptive cycle. In a horoscope, we can be receptive, receptive, like I am at the moment, very good time to get things through. We can be expressive, receptive, and have a bit of the outer world and a bit of the inner world. Or we can be expressive, expressive, when the soul pushes us out. And so the cycles are very, very important. As we know with the full moon meditation, we need to be very, very receptive at certain times uh, of the year at the full moon. and the that is also astrologically based as well. And so we don't have to choose to take the fast track path. We don't have to choose in any one life to intervene with our spiritual development, but we may well get a lot of pressure from our soul to do it. And if we don't do it, we can let it go to the next life or the life after that. But evolution will take place, but not exponentially, as we can do it in this life, it will happen on a more of a linear basis. And you may find that that's not enough for you, but you have to put your energy and your efforts into a concerted and realistic program because there's another great law called the law of economy, which sits behind the third ray of active intelligence. And ask yourself, how do you use your time, your energy, your money, your resources? Do you channel them appropriately? Well, what is appropriate channeling? Well, um, I want to mention, first of all, the difficulties and why we have the difficulties with the emotional body before we can talk about channeling our energies. And that is that we have to realize spiritual, mental, this is a simple fourfold picture, emotional and physical. The spiritual plane is a plane of force. 
and I'll include in that the spiritual energies of Atma, Buddhi and Manas. Mental energies, you can read something, it can be words, whatever, it's a, a fixed idea of some sort and we talk about thought forms. The great theosophical clairvoyant C.W. Leadbeater, uh, along with another great theosophist Annie Besant brought out a beautiful book called Thought Forms. If you've not seen it, I hope Barry's got some copies, you'll see the forms of, and not just the forms of nice music coming out of cathedrals, but the thought forms that are mixed in with emotion and come out as anger or rage. And the emotions are also like spiritual, they are a force. And my guides have told me if there are two things that are holding back human evolution massively, and they see it obviously clairvoyant because they're in the inner world, it's fear and desire. And these two, um, when the desire is a desire, not an aspiration like the TOS, for example, it's an aspirational organization doing things altruistically. This is where desire is to do with your desires, desires that have been thwarted, desires that have been so frequently habituated that they, they, you cannot break the habit when you want to. And that this emotional force will for sure get in the way of the spiritual development because we have to take the energy from here, which is I will love you if you love me back, and watch out if you don't because I'm coming for you, which is at the solar plexus level, we have to take it to the heart level. And Teresa, who will be speaking this week, talks from the heart because she's exemplifying the second ray of love wisdom. Love wisdom, love wisely, wisdom lovingly applied is the second ray of buddhi. But can we do it? Because this is altruistic. It doesn't ask for anything back. It loves for the sake of loving. And we have to go there at one stage. And so we have to sublimate emotions to buddhi, but we also have to destroy the dweller on the threshold because this is a cloud in your aura of whatever these negative desires, fears are, which will stop you from seeing your solar deva, angel, the soul, whatever. And we can only do it by imposing our will and our mind, which are higher energies on there. And therefore we have to see this astral body as being the product of many, many, many incarnations, and that's why we have problems with it. We can identify it as our own nature. Oh, you fly off the handle. Yes, but that's just me. A leopard can't change its spots. People think that what they are innately in this lifetime is part of their personality, sure, but they think it's to be preciously guarded. Oh, I'm like that. I love the glamour of teaching. Not me, but the important thing is, if I did, it would be part of my dweller. And I'm very aware of my dweller. And when I go through with some people about their dwellers, like a lady I had come to see me on Thursday afternoon, they break down into tears and they say, it's all true. It, my life is full of fear and these desires that I can't. And that's the first realization that there has to be a change of, but you've got to want the change of attitude. You will be helped because the force of evolution is to bring things up there. And so personality integration starts with understanding that there is something in theosophy called kama manas. Kama is desire and manas is mind. And think about when you have thoughts, are they really mental projections or are they actually fueled by desire? We do something, we say, I'm going to do this, but the motivation behind it is emotional. And that's Kamamanus. And we are required, if we're to get to the third initiation, to have a mental body which is dealing with pure mentality. And so the personality integration, which we all have to understand, is the purifying and refining of these bodies so that they become uh, an organized and coordinated vehicle for the expression of higher truth. You know, I know some new age people and they're saying, oh, but you should see what the, you know, and then they're living their lives with their astral bodies and their mental bodies in a way that it's easy to get up onto the new age consciousness. 
but I'm asking you to look at yourselves and say, what is there about this that may need change? And there's the whole science of emotional intelligence that's now come to the fore, and we're starting to understand that we do need to work on our emotions. Now, the integrated personality, therefore, will be someone who can think on the mental plane. There's a project, there's a job, there's a service that they want to do, and they can expound it on the mental plane very clearly. The emotions then are used to channel pure force behind that. And the physical body is there to bring into outer coordination under the seventh ray, the seventh ray of order, organization, ceremonial, ritual, and magic. Magic so important. What does it mean? The spiritualizing of matter. And Peter Barton talks about the spiritualizing of matter. How can we spiritualize matter? Which isn't just the mineral kingdom, it's the plant kingdom. And importantly to all of those with beloved pets, it's the animal kingdom. And then we have to radiate out energy. We can't spiritualize humanity until we can start to work from some viewpoint of the soul. And so we know that thinking abstractly, having a heart that is altruistically organized and is pushing outwards into the world and having uh, the will of the soul, not my will, but thy will be done. Because what I'm finding, ladies and gentlemen, is that all of my thoughts and my will actually are starting to pale into such insignificance that I'm hungry for the higher powers to give me the opportunity to move forward. Because there's nothing any of us can do to bring up here that is a greater concept that's what's coming down here. Because we're part of a divine plan. We're not just part of uh, the, the order of evolution. We're involved with all these energy fields. And so I have to move, mindful of the time, I want to give you some time to make, ask some questions, to this very important idea of the causal body, which wraps itself around the soul uh, in what we call petals of a lotus. So if you can imagine the lotus of your soul is a uh, crystal, beautiful jewel inside three layers of petals. The outer layer of petals that say they're green are the knowledge petals. It's not knowledge surfing the internet or in the old days looking in an encyclopedia. It's self-knowledge. It's what you can learn about yourself to change yourself. What can I learn about? Am I emotionally intelligent? Do I go off in a... Am I this type of thing here? And when we open the knowledge petals, it is something that we're doing on what I call vertical integration because we're starting to uh, uh, look within ourselves and towards our soul, any refinement of the bodies. And then in the, in, in the second tier of petals, which we'll see as blue, are the love petals. And I've already mentioned that this is to do with lifting love energy from people. And you can feel these energies. People say, my stomach turned over. I've got a knot in my stomach. They're talking about emotion and energy at the solar plexus level, and it has to go to the heart level. And that's what we're talking about to open. And it means that lots of people are thrown with partners who they're not compatible with because they are required to show unconditional love to that person. Because if everybody is on the path at different stages, some people will have a capacity to love that's up there, and other people will have a capacity to love there. Now, if this person up is like, come on, I've loved you that much, you've got to do better than that. The person can't do it because they may have had 50 lives less. And so often we are given partners who are there to help us see what we can't get to ourselves. And I can often see this in the charts and I say to the lady, your husband, he presses all your buttons. He does. How do you know that? I said, that's his role. Well, I didn't ask him to do that. No, well, you didn't. But the soul wanted you to because there's valuable things come out of a partnership like that. And so I look at partnerships and for other people as well in a very different way. And again, the love petals are to do with vertical integration. However, when we are heading off towards 
uh, an integrated personality will get a fair dollop of sacrifice petals. I can count these up in the chart quite easily for people because you'll know in any chart you have uh, all, all the planets of any whichever scheme of astrology it is you'll have all the planets but you won't have planets in every sign and you'll have planets typically in a num uh, six, seven signs. That will give me the complement. These are the sacrifice petals, and the sacrifice petals are what we give out in service. It's and there's a lot of people who do are required to do a lot of service. I'm opening seven sacrifice petals in my chart, and that means that I'm, I've got a lot of work to do in the outside world. But someone who's only opening one or no sacrifice petals gets the opportunity to open the knowledge and the love petals and they may be pulled to theosophy but again it's the way you economically use your time and energy in going down these fields and it was purely by I won't say coincidence it's the wrong word but um, uh, uh, Chris mentioned in, in, in opening up tonight about the meditation the study and the service and there they all are and basically they these form what we call the petals of the causal body so there's the sacrifice petals to do with the will of the soul and at one point you will get the question asked to you are you prepared with your integrated personality to hand this over to the higher counterpart and trust that it will lead the way for you and that's a big question and a question that's come up in my life. Are you prepared to see this as a, not to have it as a concept on the mental plane, not to read wonderful things about other people's souls, but as it was put to me, to take a step off the, the cliff be, and not sit in the cafe on the edge. Ted or Edward as they call me in the inner world you've been sitting in the cafe on the edge what do you mean well you keep going back for another cup of tea and you say I'll make that leap tomorrow or the next day or the next day and perhaps we should furnish this cafes with books about fine art of jumping and maybe maybe we should have seminars on how to jump but we'll do jumping another day how about parachutes and so we, we notice that the causal body is something which is in a way entrapping the soul necessarily while it has its work to do in the world of personality. But at the third initiation, and I've had this given to me very clearly in a sequence of inner, vi in, inner visions which come through meditation, Fohat, mentioned this morning by Janet, is a positively charged energy. I think Alice Bailey in the, said, Fohat digs holes in space. And I think in the secret doctrine is bubbles in Coilon. And Coilon is like the, the, um, uh, the unmanifest. Neg positively charged energy is applied to the head centers by the rod of initiation when and only when it is safe to do so. And there have been degrees of integration of the body in the way that we I have tried to describe and we're getting towards the end of the journey now and I'm not saying that we should all be waiting for this to happen but we would know if the work has been done on the physical body which is ray seven is there a degree of order in your life or are things chaotic is there a degree of organisation to the extent that you know pretty... If so, you've passed the first initiation. It's not a fire initiation. I would say that people in the room here had. The second initiation is harder. Again, my understanding from my own experience of it is it is not a fire initiation, but it is a time of great trauma when the astral body is shaken and shaken and shaken. It can be the sudden death of a person. It can be some situation where huge demands are placed emotionally on the person by relativity or whatever and if the astral body pulls through it is equivalent to uh, ray six being transmuted that solar plexus being transmuted to the love and we see it in often in the buddhic and the western mystics and then finally at the third initiation the mental body has to be tough and you know a lot of the mental body's toughness comes from being knocked about by externa in the outside world. 
So people say, I've had 10 years in this job. It's been a hell of a job to go through. I've been bashed and pushed from pillar to post. So, but are you a stronger person? Oh yeah, I, I can deal with it. That's what the, so, not so bothered about how pleasant the work in life was or the life in public was, but it is the 10th house. It's also the house of initiation. And this initiation fire is given out. And when the coiled up sleeky, sleeping Kundalini is at the base of the spine, and she hears the roar of her mate, she hisses and starts to move up the tracts, the etheric tracts of the uh, what's called susuma, the central, and she'll vivify each chakra. But if there was blocks here, there would be absolute mayhem caused and the person would be probably under great danger. And so this will not be applied, but if it is applied and the energy raises up, then it brings more life and more consciousness. And life is the first aspect and consciousness is the second aspect of, of being, and that's the first and the second ray. And man or woman will be changed forever. And what this then does is it brings in the energy of the monad and the monad's energy burns away the first of all this sheath radiates with fire and then it burns away and the soul in conjunction with the capa reaction capacities of the personality is released to what Bailey describes as our individual place in the buddhic ashram we all have a place in hierarchy which is above the earth in the individual uh, to, to go to as an individual soul made up of an energy of pure buddhi and that then will complete the vertical integration and no more meditation and study will be required and we enter into a life of full service full service for the inner worlds and it can be done whilst living in a personality if that personality has been bashed and your personalities in different ways have been knocked about by the events of your life don't see those events as being negative in any way they are bringing you to a position whereby you will be able to link with your soul if you can have the attitude like i've been asked by the inner world to have the attitude that however you get bashed about it is important to know that you are refining something which will then become part of something else that you use for service and so we get to the point where we see that the journey has to be handed over. We have to play our bit in this particular sphere. Sure, we have to be mindful of our karma. And with our long-term karma ruled by Saturn, we can't change it. It can come back to studies in the inner world by Dr. Baker showed that the karma of the Kennedy family went back to them being a group of cruel and scrupulous Caesars in the Roman Empire. And think of the karma that's created and it comes back again and again and again into the group, the family karma, and may still continue until the karma is exhausted. What we can do something about is the karma which is short term, it relates to this life and the previous lives, and that is by by being harmless in thought, word and deed. That doesn't mean by being an ineffectual person and not standing up for something that isn't right. I try not to create karma in my life, but I had to take my employers to court, as some of you, you know, because they wouldn't pay me. And I was told, you've got to fight for what is right. There will be no karma attached if you fight fairly. And I did fight fairly and I lost. Having said that, <laughs> Having said that, I cleared off a, a lot of karma. And so I can smile about it now and thank you all for enjoying it as well. Um, okay, it's probably a little bit earlier than I said, but I think at this point I would like to ask people to um, either have some questions, to come back at me on any points that I've made and just to, to make it a little bit more rounded because I, I, as some of you that know me well, I could go on and on. So, um, would we like to, could we open it to the floor? Would you raise your hand, please, if you have a question? Or, or an observation, yes. yes uh, Tim. Tim at the back. Um, Ted, a lot of um, writers, well, certain writers have said that approximately 95% of the human race is polarised on this astral level. Yes. Would you go along broadly with that? I, I, I would, broadly. I think the Kamamanas thing is, 
Okay, um, certain writers have made the point that humanity is probably polarised around 95% towards the emotional plane. That's what the question was, and it was asking for my view on that. And um, I think it is evident from looking at current affairs, and particularly sometimes in countries... <laughs> no. Broad, broadly, yes. And can you see, Tim, how we can get into such a mess if these are the ruling, if these are the ruling energies behind decisions? And I, I, you know, I would agree with that. I think, I think, although man thinks he thinks mentally, it's the emotion that is the um, driving force behind. The, uh, the, the actions that come out. And I, I think in Alice Bailey's book, A Treatise on White Magic, she particularly talks about the, the battleground of the emotions that we must all face. And the initiate obviously has to face them first. Would you say that that situation is going to persist for the foreseeable future? Or are we going to see uh, a diminution of that over the coming decades? Yeah, um, astrologically we're in a period of transition between the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius and there is a particularly strong aspect in the chart as we speak now, in the chart, the transiting chart, and that's that the planet Pluto is in Capricorn. And when Pluto is in Capricorn, everything is being shaken. And it went into, uh, Pluto went into Capricorn in January 2008 not long after which I said there could be some shaking of institutions which may be related to Capricorn, Taurus, financial institutions, it's due to carry on shaking till 2024. And I think a lot of the world order, if we look round at what's happening in the world, things are being shaken. I don't think you can, you can gloriously usher in the age of Aquarius while there is so much relating to the age of Pisces, which is what you're basically talking about. And so we have to have a fairly rough transition. And that 2024 is an interesting time because again in the Bailey books uh, D DK has said that there can be a, the possibility a potential of a new renaissance in Europe and it's interesting to note that Europe has almost certainly lost its dweller on the threshold by two world wars but America with a six ray personality hasn't because how often do you still see and I'm not we're not going to enter into political debate here on capital punishment hey man you've killed it we're going to kill you in a lethal injection you do this to us we'll do it to you and I've got something very interesting to say about the future evolution which I've been given on America, which I'll be doing uh, right at the beginning of the first third eye opening on Wednesday. But to go, to go back to the point, I would think that there has to be the breakdown of material and emotional structures for people to see that there has to be another way before we can, we can move away from. And it's because of the way man has used the six ray energy of the age of Pisces was meant to be more glorious than it's turned out to be but the divine plan can't get it right all of the time and the humans have their free will and the masters cannot intervene in karma that's not theirs if we do things on the earth and we mess it up we have got to put it right under the direction of the masters but they can't come down and put, because we've created it and by the law of the universe we have to solve it as well so i think that's why we're having a rough time at the moment part of the reason why thank you tim What can I ask people generally? Did they find? Oh, there's a question at the back. Yes, Christine. It's an unusual question. Um, fracking is something that is happening in the water. The, pla the planet Earth um, is a planet in esoteric astrology. Well, she's talking about the subject of fracking and whether there is anything that can be done to stop the process from going ahead. That was the essence of the question, wasn't it, Christine? Yeah, 
Okay. Well, well, my view is that we, particularly if we have um, a, a well-placed Earth, we are all responsible for the planet Earth, but we also also have to live on the planet as well. If we are going to create, as what happened with the huge oil spill, uh, the, the BP off the coast of America, if we are going to create for the other kingdoms, including the mineral kingdom, which includes the crust of the earth, if we are going to cause great problems for that, then that is anti-evolutionary and something will be done to make the process stop. I don't know what. However, all I can say right now is that I know two people who have both got Sagittarius rising, which is the Earth, and they are involved in anti-fracking movements. And I'm, I, I need to go with them and look at their charts, but they're bringing this more into my attention. But we must not just do things for the sake of material well-being. But at the same time, we have to survive on this planet as well. And there may well be a Libran thing here which is involved with the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says perhaps we shouldn't do this. The spirit of the law says there's a compromise there somewhere. And often Libran balance has to be brought in. And I suspect that the answer, well, we will have to reach some sort of compromise because we sure need the energy to keep us going. Okay. Oh, Ruby. Um, the short answer is, or I'll tell you the way I did it, the short answer is that we assess ourselves in four areas. In earth signs there's a challenge of the desire for security. In water signs the desire for love and response and that can include sex. In the air signs it's the desire for new experience and in the fire signs it's the desire for recognition in the world. And you may smile to yourselves, but I'll tell you what I did. I used to star myself as how I was doing with these. So I think the first thing is to recognize the nature of desire. What is it that is impelling you to have the attachments that you have? And to write them out and then maybe have a five star sequence. And in the end, the one that was really bugging me uh, as a problem was the desire for security. And within a year of highlighting that, my soul swept into me in many, many dreams. Remember, you get dreams when your soul can't get through to you if you don't meditate. And you're thinking from the moment you go to wake up at the, uh, in the morning, to the moment you go to sleep at night and there isn't a cessation of thought at all whatever it is how can the soul drop your signpost so it waits till you're asleep and then it hammers you with images some of which you'll remember some of which you don't and if you don't write them down it won't give you the story in one go you in three or four parts and so i got an image of how the job that i was doing i was well respected in my was part of my dweller part of my dweller and for somebody else, that job might have been a very healthy part of their personality development on the evolutionary arc, uh, on the involutionary arc. But on the evolutionary arc, we may be asked to give up things because the desire is so strong to keep making money, to keep having a materialistic life. So I'm doing no harm to anybody, but I just must keep making this money, whatever it might be. And so we get to the point of what Madame Blavatsky says is that we may have to pull out the roots of the lower nature if the gentle flower of the soul is to survive. So there is an element here of sacrifice. I mentioned sacrifice going down before, but we have to, we have to consciously re-identify with something else to put in the place of the desire that we're going to negate. So, I mean, the desire for security is particularly illusory because our souls could pull out at any time and leave us with what? Our consciousness. So it depends where your consciousness is and where you identify your consciousness, physical, astral, lower mind, higher mind, but ex that's going to determine where you go when you leave the planet Earth. And so this is a preparation of your energies for the next world. 
in many ways. Most of us don't like to think of our lives like, oh, it's much more than that. I've got three grandchildren. I go every Wednesday, I go to bridge. Whatever it might be, it's the life and it's seen to be very, very important. And I'm saying that the shift and the refocus of your identification needs to be looked at. And so the two things in, in direct answer to Ruby's questions are try and assess what it is. Aqu Aquarius, with its nice wavy sign, which also rules WWW, World Wide Web, is a great knowledge and uh, inclusive social um, uh, gathering which can help humanity greatly uh, in, in the age of Aquarius. But it is also the sign of detachment. And what we should have in our relationships is a love for our husbands, wives, partners, children, whatever it be, a heart love, which allows them to exist, but doesn't hold them in a place of your mind and have that attachment to it. Attachment is Taurus and it's square in astrology to Aquarius and Aquarius is detachment. So it's the ability to love, but to love for the pure joy of loving. And you'll feel the energy there instead of there because you're not asking for anything back from it. And so particularly with the astral plane, it's to look at its higher counterpart, which is the buddhic plane, but you'll still have to look at those desires in the way. And probably two or three of those desires won't pull you. There'll be one in particular that does. And it could be that you're an older person who's seen their daughter grow up with a couple of children and you want to be around to be a good grandparent to those children. Remember, those children have souls and the daughter has a soul as well and it's much much better as my mum did a year before she died of terminal cancer she said I want to tell you something I know I'm very very ill and I'm only telling you this because somebody said it was it was good and I should mention it she said to me she said listen she said grieve for me for a few months and that's fine you've been very close to me Ted you've been a good lad but she said I'm only catching the early train you're going to be on that same train and you may only have that many years so make it count whatever you do whatever you need to go make it count because you'll be on that train too and it's always later than we think don't say I'll put it off till next year we don't know we had the very sad death, all of us, to face of John Gordon, respected lecturer. His new book on initiation is being sold by Barry, who in the middle of May died suddenly with no apparent. We, it's later than we think for all of us. Don't let it be too late for you to get hold of these vehicles of consciousness and do something about it. And I will always be there to be contacted if people want advice either astrologically of which I get a great source of information about your lives or to be able to talk to you as a spiritual uh, brother on the path. Part of my role as an elder brother is to give out information that I've been privy to get because remember I've opened myself up with the right side of my brain. As people say Ted's got in touch with the feminine side now. Maybe I have, but it's damn valuable to be able to do that because it gives you the other side of things. Are we doing for time? Is that, is that okay now? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.